The following is an exclusive presentation of WI Garden Media, the voice of Garden Talk Radio. Coming up on the program today, we're going to go over how to maximize your garden space, as well as life below the soil. Our guest will be author Tasha Greer and answering your garden questions. And it all starts right now. You are listening to the most informationally packed hour of garden-focused radio in the country and on the internet with your host, husband and wife team, Joey and Holly Baird. This is the Gardening with Joey and Holly radio show. Welcome to the Gardening with Joey and Holly radio show. I am your host, Joy Baird. Beside me is my wife, co-host, best friend, and gardening partner. Holly Baird. This show is about you, for you, to help your garden grow better, to maintain your landscape, grow healthier trees, and preserving what you grow indoors and out, as well as get your grass a little bit greener. You can find us in a couple of different platforms. Uh, you can get a hold of us in a couple of different platforms. You can email us at gardentalkradio at gmail.com. You can give us a call at 1-800-927-SHOW. That's 1-800-927-SHOW. If you'd like to talk to us, have a question for us, we can certainly get your question answered. If you can't get through, leave a message. We will call you back. If you're, we thank you for taking time out of your day, whether you're listening to us on one of the 15 stations that are broadcasting our program across the United States and in uh, a mobile app, the in-studio video replay or podcast replay or anywhere in between. We thank you for doing such. we got a big show lined up for you, so let's get into the program, Holly. And uh, we're going to go over maximizing your garden space. Uh, we're now in a position where... It's that time of year when we're planting or planning to plant or very close to planting, and we want to maximize every available space that we have. Right. That's definitely important. That's why we're going to maximize. So, so you can start with um, being creative with containers. So maybe you have some planters around your front yard. You can always grow some vegetables in those or herbs or something, or you can just... Put containers in spots that you think that you want to grow some vegetables. Uh, containers can be anything. Uh, they can be a bucket with holes in the bottom of it. They can be uh, more eye-pleasing. There, there are different uh, vases and vases in which you can grow in. You can get a root maker grow bag or raised bed. They had that white finish, that heat-coated uh, the finish that reduces the amount of heat going into the roots uh, from root maker coupon code radio 21 and you can knock uh, 15% off your entire entire order by doing such um, and in many other ways in which you can be creative such as foodscaping uh, putting vegetables or edibles in amongst your flowers around your home right so um, actually our guest later is going to talk a little bit about edible landscaping but yeah you can definitely Get creative. You can grow herbs. You can grow if maybe you have where you can't grow on the side of your house or the front yard or something. You can kind of sneak stuff in like root vegetables. People aren't going to see the vegetables coming out of the top of the soil. So you could put some root crops in um, and even. Well, like, if you're in an area where you can't grow vegetables in the front yard, Swiss chard, big yeah. leafy green kale, kale, big leafy green, ornamental kale, edible. It's, it, just because it's ornamental doesn't mean it can't be eaten. It, it, it's very edible. And there's other tricks along the way there. Um, for many people in urban settings, you have to, you know, you only have so much horizontal, so you got to go vertical. Right. So one thing you can do is you can definitely trellis um, anything that you can. So vine crops. What kind of trellis can you use? You can use whatever you got. That's right. <laughs> so whether it be two posts with some twine around it, wrapped around or you buy yourself a fancy trellis or you find something free on the side of the road and stick it stick two posts so that it stabilizes you can use anything it, it for us it doesn't have to be eye pleasing it has to be functional because by the mid to end portion of the season it should be con completely consumed by whatever vegetation that you have utilized you're using using it to grow up cucumbers yeah, beans whatever the case Especially pole beans, they tend to really take over those trellises. Right, and pole beans can grow anywhere from 8 to 18, 20 feet because we've had them go up and then come back down and the whole thing. So uh, anything uh, whatsoever. Now, speaking of growing vertical, 
we have a front yard garden uh, at our residence, and we have a fence that divides that from a four foot. Um, I, I don't know what you want to call it. There's a walk. There's a sidewalk four feet below the property. There's a, a retaining wall, and then there's a fence. Well, we can utilize, and we do utilize that fence. And that provides us with about 150 more square feet of vertical growing. That's where we utilize our be- our pole beans and our cucumbers um, on that fence. I think it's like an erosion wall. Okay. That would be yeah, a, a better, yeah. more classy term. Right. So then, yeah, you can use the fence. But and- now if you're in a residential area and you just have those normal chain link fence things between you and the neighbors, you might want to you know, talk to your neighbor, assuming that you guys like each other. And, you know, let it ask if it's okay to do this or can we, you know, whatever goes on your side, you can pick, et cetera, et cetera, that you just don't go digging underneath the fence and stuff's growing up because people don't like that. No, typically not. (laughs) So Square foot gardening. Yeah, definitely. You can, square foot gardening is a great method because it's going to give you the most bang for your buck and it's, it's just a method of laying out your garden most efficiently. So you go by square foot or by grid essentially. So... It's the concept that like one square foot for a tom- or one tomato for for a square foot, nine beets, sixteen radishes, and it goes on. And there's a whole there's a whole book on it, but you can find a lot of information online. And this does not have to only be utilized in a raised bed. This can be done on the ground. This can be done in containers, raised beds. It, it can be utilized in any type of method that you're growing. Uh, four by four foot raised bed or ground that's 16 square feet you can have 16 different little gardens in that big garden uh nine bean plants nine be- beet plants 16 radishes 16 carrots a tomato plant etc cetera, etc cetera, and on and on and then whenever the radishes get done you pull those 16 out and you put nine bean plants in or whatever's going to go in behind it you re- or, or revitalize the soil yeah yeah or a tomato or whatever and then that's kind of the same concept as well not quite the same as succession planting that's more of like reusing your space for different crops or seasonal well, seasonal su- succession planting you plant one row of corn uh, of beans this week you wait a week you plant another row so they're they're coming in throughout the progression of the season if you don't want everything to come in at once so you can preserve it like if you're going to can you wouldn't want to necessarily do that totally you would want to do a full bed and then wait a week and do another full bed so you'd have that succession planting and that harvest uh, over the course of the summer that you can you know have volume enough to can or preserve yeah we do that with cilantro in our windowsill that's another thing is you can grow a lot in your if you have a nice windowsill area that gets good light like a south facing window you can grow things in that window and people use the happy leaf led grow light and grow year round because they don't have the availability or access to that outside free ambient light uh, so they grow under grow lights. So intercropping is a good one. And we, we did this just this uh, recently with our onions and radishes, leeks, and shallots. What it, the concept is you plant a fast-growing crop in amongst slow-growing crops. So what we utilized was we planted a row of onions. We, we planted two rows of onions. And between those two rows, we put a row of radishes in. Onions take from the starts that we've grown ourselves, uh, 90 to 100 days to bulb and be ready to harvest. Radishes take 30 days. So by the time those radishes are ready to harvest in a month, it's not going to hurt or impede the growth of those onions or leeks or whatever we're growing in between, but we can utilize more space and get another crop out of that area. And this can be done in many different applications. We're just utilizing the onions between the onions in order to, to... put our point across uh clearly right so yeah you can you can think about that the intercropping to help let's talk about watering yeah watering so irrigate we use irrigation in our raised beds uh from dripworks.com and you might think what does watering have to do with maximizing your garden space and we also use from water hoop yeah uh we use water hoop as well uh yeah why why does what does watering have to do with maximizing your space holly well, if you think about it, if you're not watering your plants properly, they're going to possibly die. But if anything, they might not be as fruitful or provide you as much bounty as they could. So something like irrigation, bringing in irrigation, will help keep those plants properly watered. And that will help them stay nice and ready throughout the season. 
and you're going to get your best crop. And and we got our irrigation system again from dripworks.com. We've got it on a timer, a digital timer at, that it's set to run 20 minutes at, at a time, three times a day, 8 a.m., noon, and 4 p.m. for 20 minutes. And that keeps the soil moist, not soggy. And it allows the plants to not be stressed because when you don't water your plants and you rely on nature to do that, there's times where the plants are only in survival mode and they could care less that they're producing tomatoes or eggplants or peppers. They're just trying to survive. And then they get stressed and they put on a small amount of fruit in order to carry on the traits and they shut down and they die because they don't have the, the, new, the water that's needed. Right. It's an investment that's well worth the, the, the small price to pay for a system to where you don't know how to keep up with the harvesting because the plants are so happy and healthy that they continue to produce for you. Right. And then if you don't have a large garden, maybe you have some containers, there's a lot of options for you as well out there to keep those containers nice and watered. And even if you don't, it's just good to get yourself on a schedule. Obviously, our irrigation has a schedule you can get yourself on a schedule for watering so that you are making sure you're consistent. And in the less than the amount of water you have to do, mulch can be utilized to increase your uh, your your the health and, and the productivity of your plants because you're holding moisture in, you're suppressing the weeds because they're not being able to grow because you got mulch on them, and everybody's more happier. You save in water, the plants are watered with the moisture, they're not losing it, they're not stressed, everybody is happier, uh, and uh, happy, healthy plants are more capable of defending off of insect and pest damage or infestation than a weak, stressed, and dehydrated plant. Definitely. Um, and then also just making sure you're controlling the pests. So whether that be um, some sort of caterpillar that's eating your plants or aphids, just make sure you're looking for that because it's going to help maximize your garden if you are controlling those pests right away. Well, something else you can control is how you produce or uh, take up and uh, produce the meat that you consume, whether you're looking for seasonings and spices or whether you are actually processing big game, little game, the uh, animals that you're growing on your homestead or farm. Walton's Incorporated has everything but the meat that can get you where you need to be. Yeah, the Gardening with Joy and Holly radio show is brought to you today by our sponsor, Walton's Inc. We know you care about your food. We care about you care about canning and preserving your fruits and vegetables. But with the meat at waltonsinc.com, you can get all the equipment, seasoning, supplies to make sausage, jerky, and other any other meat product your way to your standards. You can make meat sticks, all sorts of great things. You can get more information also at meatjustics.com to help you find make the best finished product. Walton's has a full line of their own meat grinders, mixers, sausage stuffers to help you go from animal to edible. Walton's, everything but the meat. That's waltonsinc.com. And if you're not a processor of uh, animals, but you want good seasonings, Walton's has a vast variety of seasonings in which you can apply to the meat in which you're grilling this summer or in the house. So do not go anywhere. When we come back, we're going to learn about a little bit about what's under the soil, life under the soil. There's more to it than just a few earthworms. You're listening to the Gardening with Joy and Holly radio show, a program to help your garden grow better. Got a question for Joey and Holly? Send it via email anytime to gardentalkradio at gmail.com. If you love growing tomatoes, then you have to try Tomato Secret by Dr. Jim's. At the Gardening with Joey and Holly radio show Gardens, we stand behind Tomato Secret and recommend it to all gardeners who would like to easily grow higher quality tomatoes with more color, flavor, less bugs, and diseases. Tomato Secret is specifically designed to grow high-quality tomatoes, and it's made with 12 natural ingredients so pure you could feed them to a cow. Simply apply one cup in the hole at planting, then sprinkle one cup around the plant one month later. That's all it takes to grow the best tomatoes on earth. With this product, you'll not have to guess what's wrong with your tomato plants because it has everything they need. 
Grow the largest and most delicious tomatoes on earth. To find out more about Tomato Secret, visit drjims.com. That's D-R-J-I-M-Z dot C-O-M. With the right tools, plant maintenance is easy and more effective. Ironwood Tool Company has the right tools for your project. From pruners to loppers to saws and shears and cleanup tools, get the right tool for this season, making your job much easier. Find them all at ironwoodtools.com. How would you like to be able to fertilize, aerate, and dethatch your lawn using just one product and at the same time improve the soil and root development? Introducing Lawn Force 5, a five-way lawn care kit in a bottle. Lawn Force 5 gives you a lush and healthy lawn you can be proud of. And it takes away the expense of hard work that comes with mechanically aerating and dethatching the lawn. Visit our friends at natureslawn.com to find out more about the amazing Lawn Force 5 product. That's natureslawn.com. Use discount code GARDEN-TALK for 10% off your order. See what all you can do with a real Tiger Torch. Visit TigerTorchLTD.com for more information. Gardening is the number one hobby and birding is the number two hobby nationwide. They go hand in hand. Birds help gardens grow by eating bad bugs. Reward them with Wild Delights premium quality mixes. Wild Delights premium mixes are made with tasty nuts and berries and not just filler food like Milo and cracked corn. Feed the birds the nutrition they need. This keeps your feathered friends coming back year after after year for your visual delight and for the happiness of your garden. Keep your feeders full all year round with Wild Delight premium bird food. Find out more at wilddelight.com. We know that you appreciate the value of a beautifully landscaped yard, but tackling such a project yourself can seem way too complicated, right? Bloomin' Easy Plants are the answer. Their plants are low maintenance and offer exceptional beauty and color for your yard. Plus, they offer free seasonal care reminders with simple how-to videos tailored to the plants that you choose. With Bloomin' Easy on your side, creating the yard that you've always wanted becomes as easy as plant, water, and relax. Check them out at your local garden center or by visiting bloomingeasyplants.com. ShipDrop is a website you can sign up for free wood chip mulch delivery right to your door. For free, ShipDrop connects homeowners and gardeners with tree services who are trying to get rid of their wood chips. You can also sign up to get free logs and firewood. Go to ShipDrop.com to learn more and sign up for a free account. Brought to you by Blue Ribbon Organics, providing locally made organic compost and soil blends for gardens, farms, landscaping, and more. Visit BlueRibbonOrganics.com or call 262-497-8539 to find their products nearest you. The Water Hoop is a portable water sprinkler system that allows you to target water evenly around the root ball of your tree or bush. Conforms to various shapes for your watering needs. The Water Hoop reduces runoff and saves money. Visit waterhoop.com. Rinse kit, your hose on the go. No pumping, no batteries. Simply fill from your spigot or sink on your way out for up to five minutes of spray time anywhere. Spray it, wash it, rinse kit. Protect your plants against damage with a 3-in-1 plant guard and special blend fertilizer. Visit ivyorganics.com. The Gardening with Joy and Holly radio show is brought to you by the following. Blue Ribbon Organics, Naturally Green Products, Ironwood Tool Company, Easy Step Products, Rinse Kit, Soul Brew Kabucha, Wild Delight, Rycon Vitova, Chip Drop, Bailbuster.com. Find all sponsors at the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com and thank them for their support. Welcome back to the Gardening with Joy and Ollie radio show. Thank you for being with us today. Well, when it comes to watering, we talked about it in the first segment. Watering is an important aspect whether you're growing vegetables, shrubs, or trees. And Tree Diaper has the device in which will make your watering so much easier. If your plants could talk to you, they would have a few complaints about not being properly watered, either too much or too little. How do you water properly? Take the guesswork out by using the tree diaper. Tree diaper is a revolutionary watering system that stabilizes soil moisture by taking up excess water and slowly releases it when plants need it. The tree diaper is filled with water from rain or when you water and slowly releases water over three weeks. No pipes, hoses, or electricity needed. Whether you're a first-time gardener or advanced Tree Diaper will improve the way you water your plants. 
Made in the USA. Check out all sizes they have available. That's TreeDiaper.com. They'll keep your plants happy. That's TreeDiaper.com. Well, let's talk about watering. We talked about watering there, but life under the soil. Many people... Um, may not understand or realize the magnitude of activity that goes on underneath just a few inches of the soil in your garden, Holly. Right. So many people just refer to soil as dirt. It's dirt. It's dirt. Um, and actually, what? Yeah, our knees. Yeah. What's that big pile of dirt? No, she knows it's not dirt. Oh, yeah, she yeah, knows yeah, it's not yeah. dirt, yeah. She's 10 years old. She, well, when is, we had compost delivered in, in the Milwaukee market here, Blue Blue Ribbon Organics delivered us, uh, set, we, we purchased seven yards of compost from them, and uh, our niece was, is like, when's the dirt going to come? Oh, I, I mean, it's I know it's not dirt. Yeah, I said, I said, you know it's not dirt. She's like, I know, I know it's not dirt, you know, in her little 10-year-old. Yeah, ten, ten year old. yeah, nothing's wrong in the world, boys. <laughs> yeah. But so. anyway, there's millions and billions of things going on literally underneath the soil in your garden. Right. So just to keep in mind, it is a, a living thing, and that's very important to know because... Not all soil is living, but the garden soil that we should be growing in should be living. Right. Uh, we don't know what the soil in the... Uh, back 40 of right. some old lot might be doing. But in our garden, you want to be living. So an average soil sample is about 45% minerals, 25% water, 25% air, and 5% organic matter. Now you can increase or decrease that organic matter based on what you choose to do, but it's just good to keep in mind what's in your soil. So mostly it's like it's sand, um, silt, clay, air, water, minerals, and organic matter and then there's also um, animals right. in it. So that includes things like worms and then also um, earthworms, grubs, centipedes, millipedes, snails, slugs, beetles, ants, fungi, insect larvae, bacteria, mushrooms, and many other organisms. So there's even just tiny little decomposers that we could probably never see. And, and you may be looking, you'll hear that list and go, well, not all of those are good things. I don't want snails in my garden. I don't want, you know, uh, beetles in my garden or ants. Well, th this is a harmony. There's good bugs and bad bugs. And by having a balanced ecosystem in your garden, they will keep each other in check. Right. So that's a, that's a few things in there. But I think the, the biggest thing we can talk about is worms. So if you have a lot of worms in your soil, it's very healthy. And worms can produce up to a third of pound. One worm can produce a pound, a one third pound of worm castings per year. So that's just one worm. That that's their that's bathroom product. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I was so, trying to keep it clean, but okay, well, yeah. Just gotta keep it real. Yeah. Um, but one third per year. Now you, that that's the bin, and you can buy worm castings. Worm castings uh, have a phenomenal property in them, in which whenever fed to plants or plants are grown in. They have they, this property is picked up by the plants, and aphids are the tick of the plant world. And aphids like to suck the juice out of plants and stress them out and potentially kill them. So what this property is doing inside of this of the plants that the worm castings are fed to, it gets ingested into the aphid, and this property causes the aphid to dissolve from the inside out, killing it. So nature keeping things in check. Yeah, it's just a it's just a balance of the ecosystem that you hopefully have a balanced ecosystem in your backyard. But what if you so, don't have worms? What do you do? I was just going to talk okay. about that. So if you don't have worms, one you thing you can do is you can add Don't go down to Jack's bait shop and get some. Right. So one thing you can do is you can add organic matter to your soil, whether that be your own compost, other compost, coffee grounds, mix those in, um banana peels, what have you, kitchen scraps, things like that. And that what will happen is the worms will realize, hey, there's food here, and they will come into your garden, and then they'll make their home there. If you go down to Jack's Bait Shop or the local gas station right. with their worms, you are introducing worms from a foreign ecosystem. Even if you think they're, they're local worms, you're still introducing worms from a, 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 a foreign ecosystem, and that could cause problems. And these worms aren't going to survive anyway. No, they're a lot not of times designed. They don't. Worms are designed to go catch fish, not 
you know, work work through fishing, your soy. Yeah, fishing, fishing worms. worms, right. Yeah, so that's um, something to definitely keep in mind. And then also, there's it, a lot of things that... And people are like, well, how does worms know that something's there? Worms will travel very long distances, and they can go very deep as well, up to eight an, feet. Yeah, yeah, that's another thing is they're going eight feet down into underneath your, your garden beds and mixing all of that stuff around and um, just help fertilizing your soil, essentially. So another thing that is amazing about earthworms is that they um, they do shred that. They shred the, the organic matter. They eat the organic matter and they poop it out. And the same thing happens with millipedes and centipedes. These, so, are, these are the ones with the creepy, crawly, multiple legs that people are like, oh, <laughs> but they that, that you got to leave them alone. Right, and beetles too. Yeah. Now, if you have some sort of beetle that's harmful above the ground. Like the potato beetle. Like the, yeah, yeah, potato yeah. beetle. That's different. These are like earth beetles. Yeah, these are the good guys. Yeah. So you want to, if you see the earth beetles crawling around, you want to leave Walk them Walk away, cringe, and let them do their thing. Right. Same thing with centipedes. I think centipedes and millipedes are the most disgusting things on this earth, and I don't want to think about them, but I'm happy that they're in my garden. Okay. Um, and then mushrooms or fungi, um, those grow out of the, mushrooms grow out of the ground, fungi, other types of fungi grows below the ground. But if you see mushrooms, don't think it's a bad thing. Definitely don't eat them. Don't let your dog eat them or your children or your cat or your pet bunny, whatever. Because they could be, they could be, um, they're good for poisonous. the soil, but bad for everything else. Right. And sometimes they're just going to grow naturally depending on moisture levels and right. what have you, and it's going to happen. Now, fungi um, is an important part of uh, microbial ecology. And a lot of people don't even understand fungi or mushrooms because they're. I knew a fungi once. Yeah. Uh -huh. okay. You are a fungi. Uh -huh. Okay. <laughs> A lot of people don't understand them. Even even people who stu who study the this mi microbiology, um, they're they're kind of an interesting being. They they're like on their own level, but they help break up the soil. They help help your soil live. And then there's mycorrhizae, which is a fungus that um, helps the root of the plants, and it helps the root of the plant grow and develop and pick up those nutrients. Effectively. Now, all of these things are living things. Yeah. Now, you can go and buy mycorrhizae powder to sprinkle on the roots before you plant things. Um, you have to check your sources to see because some places will sell dead mycorrhizae and you got to be careful what you purchase. But you can buy things such as that to mix around the root system. Yeah. A lot of people do that too, especially if you're doing a lot of, a lot of like home inside the home growing. Mm -hmm. Um, where you may not have those good things going on in the soil, you you would need to add something. Yeah, for sure. Or even just a container garden, you right. might want to look into that. But just make sure you're using a, a reliable source, essentially. But the cool thing is that if you dig through your soil, you're going to see a lot of these things. You're probably going to see sand, but you might see like tiny little white stringy looking things if you have a pile of leaves that's been laying there for quite some time and you dig through them you're going to see it looks looks like a cotton ball has exploded yeah that's the fungi right that's that's exactly it that's the fungi and the same thing in your soil um and it's just it's just a matter of keeping it balanced and the biggest thing you can do to keep it balanced is to just add organic matter whether that be leaves coffee grounds compost from a reliable source right yeah um, because a lot, a lot of cities have free municipal pickup of compost or a small fee to go get a truckload. However, you don't know what everybody else has thrown in that pile. When you get it from like more here in Milwaukee, uh, Blue Ribbon Organics or your local independent garden center that has bulk material, they have a tracking source to know where everything has come from, from source one to the mixing process, to the distributing process, to where where it's being sold at. So if there is a problem, they can go back in the chain of command and go, there's the problem. With the city, they just want your cash, basically. They want the pile gone. And this this stuff is fine if you're just going to top dress around you know, trees or shrubs. But if you're actually going to utilize this for food production, there can be harmful chemicals in this stuff. So one way to kind of figure out without actually doing a soil test on the municipality compost is 
Try to get a sample, like just a, a, an ice cream bucket full. Take it home, put five, six, seven, eight bush beans in it. Bush beans will germinate in about four days, keep them moist, uh, and they'll pop up. If everything on those bush beans looks normal, the leaf structure is fine, it's not curled up or disformed or anything like that, the soil is probably very, very good. If those beans sprout and they start, they're disformed and twisted leaves and the limbs and everything's all right, there's some kind of toxicity and that's called uh, toxic soil or poison compost, and that can pretty much kill anything that's broadleaf that you're growing, ornamental or edible. Right. So if you do want to go that route, I the only problem is is that you don't you might get that compost sample on Monday on one side of the pile and the other side's bad. Yeah. Right. <clears throat> so that's that's a little bit problematic, but it's definitely something that you could try um and i don't think the city necessarily wants your money they probably just want the compost gone but yeah definitely i don't i don't think most cities are doing it for the goodness of their heart to help people grow vegetables no but they yeah. want the compost gone yeah yeah so um and they probably get some sort of federal funding oh, I'm for sure. composting because yeah, they're not doing it for free <laughs> right um there's also nematodes and we are going to talk about nematodes next week there's right. good and bad nematodes and nematodes um are super super tiny they live in the roots of your plants, so they can live in the roots of your plants. Um, so we're going to definitely talk about that next week, but that's another thing that is in your soil as well. So we have, this is all a lot of stuff. So it's definitely to keep that in mind that your soil is a living thing, and there's a lot underneath your tomato plants that you don't even know about. Be kind to it, mulch it, uh, feed it, uh, try to not abuse it uh, if you need to dig the soil or till the soil be cautious and smart on how you do such well something else there was good bugs in there and those are some bad bugs well another bad bug is japanese beetles and it'll be warming up soon and it's really starting to get warm where we're at maybe it's where warm where you're at and you want to soon to be able to enjoy your yard whether by yourself or with your family or relatives without having the beetles and grubs bothering you yeah it's time to start thinking about those beetles and grubs there's Japanese beetles just right around the corner, and who knows what else. So Grub Gone is something that you can use. Grub Gone can be applied directly to the turf or your garden and or around ornamentals to control grubs and lessen the impact that those beetles have on your yard this summer. Easy to use. Apply with a commercial spreader or irrigate right into the soil. Biologically, that specifically targets the grubs and the beetles that invade you without harming any of those beneficial insects such as bees, butterflies, and ladybugs. Yep, and it, to be honest, it's the only non-chemical that works. You can find out more at phylumbioproducts.com. That's P-H-Y-L-L-O-M bioproducts.com. Phylumbioproducts.com. Do not go anywhere. Tracy, or Tasha Greer will be with us when we come back. Author talking about spices. You're listening to the Gardening with Joey and Holly radio show. Do you tweet? Send Joey and Holly a tweet to at Talk Gardening, and they will tweet you back. I love the Gardening with Joey and Holly radio show. And like you, we've all struggled to find a good plant support system that can last for more than a season or two and be easily stored. But now there is. Easy Step Products manufactures a unique, multifunctional, multi-purpose plant support system. It's designed for tomato plants, but it's useful for any vegetable or flowering plants you grow. This is like having a 24-7 bodyguard for your plants. The 60-inch heavy-duty Easy Step in post and Easy Rings are overbuilt by design, so that when you combine the two together, they make the perfect plant support on the market. We've never seen anything like it. We love that you can add it during the growth cycle without damaging the plant. It's easy to adjust them up or down. They store easily. They even have a no-hassle 10-year warranty. Order now and receive the third plant support absolutely free with purchase of a kit and use promo code JOEY123. Buy yours today at EasyStepProduct.com or visit the dealer locator for the closest retailer near you. Did you know that all flour is not created equal? Janie's Mill carefully stone grinds all their certified organic wheat, rye, corn, buckwheat, and heirloom and ancient grains so that you get every bit of taste and nutrition nature intended. Some flours really are better than others, and you deserve the best. Get it at janiesmill.com. 
Chapin has the tools to help you this season. We have a wide range of sprayers to help you control pests, weeds, and fertilize your plants. From handheld to ATV sprayers, we have it all. Use our broadcast spreader to feed and seed your green spaces. Water and feed at the same time with our fertilizer injectors. Find Chapin equipment at major home improvement and hardware stores and online at ChapinMFG.com. Chapin, cover more ground. We've been using a game-changing tool called SeedLinked to find and review our seeds this year. It makes finding the right seeds simple. It is driven by growers' data so you can really see what's best for your location. Check it out at SeedLinked.com or download the mobile app today. Deer Defeat is an all-natural repellent to keep deer, rabbits, and groundhogs away from your precious plants. Deer Defeat protects your plants day and night, dries clear, and odorless. It will not clog your sprayer. Deer Defeat works for 30 days through rain, snow, and freeze. Safe, effective, and works on rabbits. Money-back guarantee. To purchase, go to DeerDefeat.com and use code RADIO to save 10% on your order. Deer Defeat. It can't be beat. Seed Savers Exchange has been saving, preserving, and sharing heirloom seeds since 1975, and today continues to provide those seeds for gardeners just like you. They have over 600 varieties. Visit SeedSavers.org to request a free catalog or to purchase seeds online for this year's growing season. That's SeedSavers.org. Dig planting holes from a comfortable standing position. Step, twist, pull, and plant. Visit ProPlugger.com make watering easy. DripWorks provides quality drip irrigation supplies and equipment to gardeners just like you for all your growing needs across the U.S. and Canada. Purchase online at dripworks.com. Straight from the farm, field, and briar patch, Piper and Leaf Artisan Tea is a tea like you've never imagined it. Get our award-winning tea delivered right to your front door and become part of the Piper and Leaf family. Free shipping over $75 at Piper and Leaf. If you could double the life of your raised bed boxes by sealing the wood with a clear non-toxic wood preservative, would you? Well, now you can with a clear penetrating product called internal wood stabilizer. It's 100% non-toxic and easy to apply. Seal your untreated wood surfaces, even chicken coops, by spraying on internal wood stabilizer. It's invisible, seals the wood from the inside out, and never wears off. Recommended by organic gardening experts, internal wood stabilizer. Check it out at TimberProCoatingsUSA.com. The Gardening with Joey and Holly radio show is brought to you by the following. Pro Plugger, Dripworks, Waltons Incorporated, Tree Diaper, Janie's Mill, Phylum Bioproducts, Chapin Manufacturing Incorporated, Nature's Lawn and Garden Incorporated, Deer Defeat, Dr. Jim's, Root Maker. Find all sponsors at the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com and thank them for their support. Welcome back to the Gardening with Joy and Holly radio show. Question for you. Tasha Greer will be moments away here, but question about ants. Do you have ants in your home? Do you have ants in your basement around your property? Well, ants can be utilized uh, by getting rid of them. They're not good. And Rescue has an ant bait trap that can fix your problem. Yeah, ant colonies are popping up in the spring. And they seek food and moisture sources to feed their colonies. So once they establish that source, they put out pheromone trails to let their ant buddies know. And you can send these ants packing um, to the rescue ant bait stations. And they'll transport the bait back to the colony, killing ants at the source. Ants look for sugars. And they look for uh, protein. They want to feed their workers and their queens. And ant rescue ant baits use both protein and sugar for a faster and more complete colony kill. Unlike other ants, baits that leak and spill back to bait on your floor, rescue ant baits are spill proof and they are mess free. They're child resistant and safe to use around the home. It's a better bait, no mess, and rescue ant baits have it all. Go to rescue.com for where to buy and all their other products made in the USA. There you go. Holly, let's go to the hotline and bring in our guest for this week. Yeah, Tasha Greer is a homesteader and writer focused on simple and sustainable sustainable living. She is the author of Grow Your Own Spices and the blogger on simplestead.com. Welcome to the program, Tasha. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Well, we thank you for taking time out of your day to join us on the program. So you refer to yourself as an Epicurean homesteader. 
What does that mean to you? Well, when I first started homesteading, I was kind of just trying everything, and uh, I was spending a lot of time on the wrong kind of activity. <laughs> so I finally realized that I needed to have some sort of philosophy to guide my decisions. And uh, and so I kind of stumbled along uh, the idea of Epicureanism, and it's really kind of like taking a whole perspective look at, uh, at the activity, deciding if you're really going to enjoy it, and also if it's going to get you the sort of long-term um, you know, benefits that you're looking for. So it's, uh, I mean, it's an ancient Greek philosophy and, uh, it's, I'm applying it in modern terms, but it's really kind of helped guide my decisions, um, you know, and just to find ways to homestead successfully without stress, with more pleasure. <laughs> I didn't want it to be hard. I wanted to have fun. <laughs> Without stress, I think that that's kind of the key word in that uh, description. Yeah, definitely. Because I think, you know, I mean, we're not used to doing these things. We're used to going to the grocery store and, you know, going to just buy what we need. And so when you first start doing it, it's a little bit overwhelming. Um, and it, so it seems so hard. But now that I've been doing it for, you know, over 10 years, I realized that I made it a lot harder than it needed to be. It's, uh, it's, this is basic human stuff that people have been doing for ever, and now we've got the internet and books and things to, um, you know, make it a lot easier. And so I think it's like when I realized how simple things could be, it just all kind of started to click. Yeah, the things if we knew now what we wish we knew then, things would be a lot easier in life and in all aspects. Yes, definitely. But that's actually what I try to share on my blog is to try to make it easier for other people because. You know, I think a lot of, um, at least back when I started homesteading, there were a lot of new homesteaders sharing information. And so what we were all sharing was like our challenges and what was so hard about it. <laughs> and so we're all going into it thinking it has to be hard. But now that I have a bit more experience, I'm like, okay, let me tell you what's really simple about it. <laughs> and that way you can maybe kind of shortcut around some of the, the more challenging parts. Exactly. Now you have goats and many people may want to raise goats. Why should people who are able to, and every, all the laws are followed in their municipalities or, or areas, why should people raise goats, and maybe why shouldn't they raise goats? I, I think, you know, first and foremost, if you, you know, like um, goat's milk, if you like making cheese, if you like goat's meat, um, in the U.S. we don't need a whole lot of goat meat, uh, but in other countries it's kind of a, a staple meat source, so... Um, so, you know, I think first and foremost, you, you need to like these things. And, you know, that kind of gets back to the Epicurean side of things. Um, so if you don't like them, you're probably not going to have a whole lot of incentive to keep raising goats long term. Uh, but if you enjoy those things and, you know, want those products, then then you need to also look at your landscape. Because a lot of people think that goats are grass eaters, and they will eat grass, but they're really more... Uh, um, weed eaters. They eat all sorts of different weeds and things like that. So, you know, like I have a, I live on a mountainside and, uh, and so we have all sorts of crazy weeds and things in the deforested area that's around our house. And so it's like a perfect place for them to find all the things that they would really like to eat rather than just eating a, a grass pasture. And so, you know, I think if you like goats and you have the right landscape for it, then, you know, you're already part way there. But you also need to understand that it's a long-term commitment. Um, these animals, you get really attached to them, particularly if you milk them. So, you know, even if you um, your goat gets a little bit older, <laughs> it's kind of hard to let go when you've been bonding with them twice a day, every day for, you know, 10 years. And, uh, you know, it's, it's um, kind of like having pets. So, you know, it's, it's a very fun experience being with goats and making them part of your life. So in that respect, it's good, but I think a lot of people don't realize how much the daily commitment is, you know, that you have to clean the barn, because they do need shelter. Um, if you're keeping them on the stand, then you will also need to, you know, give them grain, which means trips to the feed store. Um, and so there's just, there's a lot to it. So I, I really think it comes down to that idea. Are you going to enjoy being with goats long term? And if that's the case, then it's really rewarding. You get this amazing milk. But if you're not sure, you're on the fence, then I, I really recommend that maybe see if you can find a friend who has goats and maybe volunteer to, to take care of their goats while they uh, 
go on a day trip or a, a weekend trip <laughs> <laughs> before you go getting a lot of goats. <laughs> I just, I just know like people, you know, people see the videos on social media, YouTube, and they're like, oh, goats are so cute, you know, and the baby goats in their pajamas and whatever. And like, I think people kind of romanticize and idealize raising a goat. And it's definitely like, like you said, it's a commitment that you become attached and you definitely have to, to have the space and everything for it. So that's uh, some great information. Now your book, Grow Your Own Spices No Matter Where You Live, looks really intriguing. Many people do try to grow new and exciting things. I know we have ourselves and sometimes we don't do so well. What is something in your book that would encourage our readers to check out, check it out and find success, especially spices we may not realize that everybody can grow? I think that's, I mean, it's a really good question. And uh, for me, I try to know the plant before I grow it. I don't just go out and look at a growing guide and find out, you know, what the temperature requirements are. I kind of dig deeper and I try to find out, um, you know, where did it grow natively? What were the conditions? What was the humidity like? What were the temperatures like? How did it grow, you know, in its native habitat? And then I try to figure out how to create those circumstances at home, you know. And so um, I think even with our vegetable gardens, it's like we just look at a quick growing guide and, oh, okay, I just, you know, need a little compost in my soil and I just need it to be this, you know, this this warm so I can plant the seeds. But we don't always think all the way through to, you know, how long is it going to take to a harvest? Um, do we have the right pollinators? Uh, you know, is it going to withstand the winds in our area? It's, so with spices, you really have to nail the conditions because a lot of them are, are very acclimated to specific climates. And so you can't just uh, throw it out in your garden and have it go right. <laughs> um, you know, even cumin, cumin is like a, it's a seed spice. It's really pretty easy to grow. Um, but if you live in a really super hot area um, where it's humid all the time, you might not even get a good crop unless you start it indoors early and, um, you know, and then eventually transplant it outside before it gets too warm and humid. So, you know, you really need to understand and make a plan for how to actually get a harvest. And I think you know, everybody just wants to start the plants, but they don't always think all the way through the entire life cycle of the plant and what it's going to need as it gets closer to, you know, its mature harvesting stage. And so I think any plant, spices or anything in your garden, it's really good to to do deeper research and really get to know the plant before you start growing it. I think very, very good advice uh, on that. Now, you teach a course on edible landscaping. What is edible landscaping and how can one start incorporating that into their own, uh, their own yard? Yeah, that's... Um, a lot of people, you know, we grow like a little vegetable garden or something, and that's a great place to start. But we also have like these whole front yards, and um, we, ha you know, you have like shrubbery and things like that that are just kind of, um, you know, covered with some mulch, and they have all this space around them. So edible landscaping is a way to use your the landscape that you have already in place and start to tuck in some edibles and get even more out of your, uh, your, your, your overall landscape than you would from just a little vegetable garden. So you kind of um, start looking for analogs. Like if you have a, some kind of flowering, you know, a flowering cherry or a flowering dogwood in your front yard, well, then you can probably grow an actual cherry that will give you fruit, or you might be able to grow an apple, um, you know, or uh, something similarly sized. Um, and, you know, basically and get food from it rather than just have a flowering plant. They'll still have beautiful flowers and they'll also then have, you know, some kind of food source. And a lot of people don't realize how beautiful some of these plants are when you put them in a grouping. You know, it's like a, a row of potatoes isn't that interesting, but if you tuck some potatoes in with some lettuce and some cabbage, it can get a whole lot more beautiful. So edible landscaping is kind of getting out of the row mindset or the bed mindset and starting to look at your vegetables and fruits and draw comparisons between those and um, the decorative plants you're using and see if you can find things that 
you know, appeal to your, your decorative, you know, aesthetic um, ideas as well as the things you want to eat. And so I think a lot of people think you have to do everything 100% edible, but you don't. You can mix and match. You can put your favorite ornamentals in there and you can put in your vegetables. You can, you know, have a lot of perennial plants and then also incorporate some annuals. You know, people go out and buy those little annual, you know, trays of flowers to put underneath their, you know, their plants in spring or something. But you could easily do the same thing with like a very you know, beautiful assortment of lettuce. So it's really just kind of starting to think about um, incorporating some food into more traditional landscapes. And, you know, especially people, I, I used to live in the suburbs and, you know, there were things that we just weren't allowed to do in our front yard. And so edible landscaping gives you an opportunity to incorporate food um, in ways that are beautiful and, you know, aren't going to offend your neighbors. <laughs> so it's, uh, you know, and then they also, you know, a lot of the edible foods that we like are also really good for pollinators, um, any of the flowering plants that we like. Um, so it's, you know, it's just a way to get out in your garden and grow some food. Well, absolutely. And, you know, a, an oak tree produces great shade and, and leaves for the garden, but a pear tree or an apple tree produces great shade for the garden, but also at a mature state, several hundred pounds of produce as well. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, even better if you can grow both because an oak tree will feed all of your pollinators. Um, it'll, I mean, basically it's an excellent food source for a lot of caterpillars and those feed the, um, the you know, all the, the birds and and the birds help you with pest control. So if you could have an oak and an apple, that's even better because you're going to get fruit. You're going to, um, you know, it's like a whole, it becomes a whole ecosystem rather than just, you know, some food. And so when you start to integrate these things, um, I think you get a much better result. And a lot of people also don't realize how many things that we don't think of as food are edible. So oak, for example, I mean, acorns, you can you can collect those acorns and you can make acorn flour. Um, you can make I make an acorn soup that tastes a whole lot like a chestnut soup. Um, and so there are even you know some decorative plants that have some edible aspects to them that people just don't, don't really think of them that way. Definitely. So how can we find out more about you? How can listeners find out more of your great information? <laughs> well, I have a blog called simplestead.com. Um, it's kind of a sort of contraction of simple and homestead. It's simplestead.com. I'm also on uh, Instagram at explorersimplestead.com. I'm sorry, explorersimplestead on Instagram. And also on Facebook under uh, Simplestead. So all of those places. Um, of course, I've got my book, Grow Your Own Spices, and it is definitely a handbook for growing spices, but it's also a way to get to know the plants. There's some herbal medicine tips in there from my friend Lindsay, who did a, um, added some really amazing information to, so you can use these spices, not just to eat them, but to improve your well-being. And um, absolutely stunning illustrations also from Greta Moore. So um, I definitely, if anyone's interested in growing spices, I think it's more than just my work. It's just a beautiful book. A lot of people did great things inside. Well, Tasha, we greatly appreciate you taking time out of your day to share your knowledge and the, the and your book with not only Holly and myself, but all of our listeners. Well, thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. Thank and when, you. When we come back, it's going to be your garden questions and our garden answers. You're listening to The Gardening with Joy and Holly radio show, a program to help your garden grow better. Got a question for Joey and Holly? Send it via email anytime to gardentalkradio at gmail.com. This week's garden tip is brought to you by Yard Glider, the cart without wheels, loads without lifting, hauls more, dumps faster, built to last, and built for hard work. Perfect for homeowners, arborists, hunters, landscapers. Pull it behind an ATV, a lawnmower, or pull it yourself. Multiple sizes available at YardGlider.com. That's YardGlider.com. Com. Working your soil when it is too wet can cause the soil particulates to compact and make it harder for plants to grow when the soil is drier. Take a handful of soil and squeeze it in your hand and into a clump and take your other hand and poke at that clump. 
If the clump breaks apart easily, the soil can be worked now. If not, you need to let it dry more. This week's garden tip was brought to you by Yard Glider. The cart without wheels, loads without lifting, hauls more, dumps faster, built to last, and built for hard work. Perfect for homeowners, arborists, hunters, landscapers. Pull it behind an ATV, a lawnmower, or pull it yourself. Multiple sizes available at YardGlider.com. That's YardGlider.com. Good bugs to eat bad bugs. RingConVitova.com. Call or email today. 1-800-248-BUGS. Straw bale gardening is all the rage. Get your bale started easily with the Bell Buster Straw Bale Conditioning Formula. This is the only product that has been specifically formulated for use in straw bale gardening. Each unit contains 250 million colony forming units of trichoderma, fungi, and bacillus bacteria in addition to the fertilizer itself produces fantastic results with a bountiful production of vegetable crops start with the best to get the best traditional or organic formula take the guesswork out of conditioning your straw bale go to bellbuster.com to find out more pomona's universal pectin is a high quality pectin that gels reliably with low amounts of any sweetener if you're trying to reduce the amount of sugar in your diet you'll love pomona's universal pectin now you can make healthy homemade jams and jellies sweetened to your taste. You can use sugar or honey to sweeten. Pomona's Universal Pectin keeps indefinitely when stored in an airtight container. Easy to use, versatile, and comes with directions and recipes in every box. Find out more and where to buy at PomonaPectin.com. Also available at natural food stores and online. Soul Brew Kombucha is founded and handcrafted in Milwaukee. 100% organic, formulated for ultimate health and enjoyment. Find out the benefits of drinking kombucha and where to purchase at MySoulBrew.com or find them on Facebook at MySoulBrew. You move your lawn sprinklers all over the yard, but you always end up putting them in the same spots. Why not just bury them there? Out of sight, always ready to use, pre-adjusted to water the precise areas you want. Quick Snap Sprinklers makes it easy in-ground sprinklers without the hassle or expense of laying pipe put the sprinklers anywhere in your lawn or garden snap on a hose to supply the water water on it pops up water off it drops below ground you can mow right over it you can have a buried sprinkler system up and running in just minutes each quick snap saves thousands of dollars they install in minutes and operate for years visit quicksnapsprinkler.com the number one key to healthy productive plants are the roots Starting from seed to full-grown plants, RootMaker.com has the answer. From seed starting trays with an innovative design that air prunes the roots, creating a fabulous root system, never again will you have root-bound plants to multiple gallon grow bag sizes to raise beds. RootMaker.com has your grow needs covered. Visit RootMaker.com. Use coupon code RADIO21 and get 15% off your entire order. The Gardening with Joey and Holly radio show is brought to you by the following. Simply Earth, Seed Savers Exchange, Quick Snap Sprinklers, Water Hoop, Timber Pro Coatings, Bloomin' Easy Plants, Pomona Universal Pectin, Ivy Organics, Tiger Torch, Happy Leaf LED, Seed Link. Find all sponsors at the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com and thank them for their support. Welcome back to the Gardening with Joey and Holly radio show. Time for your questions, our answers. You can submit your question by giving us a call at 1-800-927-SHOW. That's 1-800-927-SHOW. Or if you'd like to submit it via email, you can do that through gardentalkradio at gmail.com. That's gardentalkradio at gmail.com, Holly. Yeah, so our first question is, I'm looking to make raised beds for the sides would plywood work or it, it is large, I can cut it to the size I need it. Uh, plywood would not be a good material to use for construction of raised beds because it is a multi-material. Um, it's glued together. And when water gets on this plywood, uh, it, it, it blows apart like a sponge. Now, if you want to invest maybe in like marine-grade plywood, which is more, uh, there's many more, it, it's more waterproof. Um, you could do that. However, um, investing in like two by tens or one inch, uh, one by fours or one by eights or something like that is a much more uh, better way to go because you will pay a little bit more up front this year, but you're not going to have to repair repair the bed year after year. And that glue can leach into the soil and you, the whole thing is a, a big mess. But plywood, no, not for, for raised beds. Got time for one more. <clears throat> 
So Chris asks, I just found out about the straw bale planting. Is it advisable to plant potatoes in a straw bale? Is there an issue with the sunlight turning the spuds green? You can grow potatoes in the straw bale after you condition the bale, but um, they do not do very well. And so that's something to keep in mind. You could do something um, like a container or something else if you don't want to grow on the ground. We can do, you can do a no-till like yeah. we did. You plant it basically on top of the ground and then cover it with straw or yard debris, and that works very well. Um, uh, but and the way if you do it in the bale, you're going to have to bust the bale apart to dig the potatoes out. They don't turn green, but the production is just not to the level of what the author of the Straw Bale Garden book, Joel Karsten, thought they should. He's had some people that say great success, others said no. So it's kind of a, a hit and miss when it comes to the potatoes and the straw bale. But with that being said, other root crops do oh, do Oh, very well. well, yes. Yeah, so that's a good thing to keep in mind. Well, we are out of time, and we thank you for yours. Did you miss any portion of today's program? You can certainly revisit that by going to our parent website, thewisconsinvegetablegardener.com, and clicking on the Season 5 tab at the top of the page. Or you can send us an email at gardentalkradio at gmail.com and ask us for a copy of today's show via podcast. Uh, join us next week on the program where we'll be talking about how you can grow great tomatoes as well as nematodes, the good ones and the bad ones. Our guest will be author Kelly Norris will be with us and will answer your garden questions. So until next week for Holly Baird, I'm Joy Baird, and we will see you in the garden.